Memphis, Hamilton, Aladdin, Freestyle Love Supreme, and those are just a few. So I'm going to welcome Mr. James Monroe Eigelhart right now. Welcome, sir. We're so happy to have you here. I am very glad to be here. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, I'm sure that many of you have a favorite James moment, whether it's if you saw him on stage or if you worked with him or if you got to meet him at the stage door. My favorite moment is uh, the time before this one, I met him in person. Actually, that's the only time because we're not meeting in person right now. Stupid pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> in 2005, when I was a newspaper reporter at the Palo Alto Weekly, I interviewed James and actor Jackson Davis in the Theater Works parking lot. I'm not sure why we did the interview in the parking lot, but we did. That makes, so... sense. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it was on a rehearsal break for Into the Woods. Yeah, and that's why we were in the parking the lot. Yeah. <laughs> yes. and, and, and Jackson was playing the baker. Mm -hmm. And I remember you said this great thing. I asked you about your character, the wolf. And you said, what's my motivation? I'm hungry. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean... Some 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 characters are really really deep, and some characters are not. And so when you play the wolf, it's like, well, what? Why are you doing what you're doing? Well, he's a wolf. There's really no more other other than that. There's, there's no deeper meaning to what he's trying to do here. And I love when people do that, like especially with the Sondheim show. They're like, oh, let's find the deeper meaning. You're like, yeah, some characters are not that deep. He's just a wolf. He wants to eat the kid, eat the grandma, and we're pretty much done. Everybody else may have a deeper thing, but his character. So it was pretty fun. To, and just when you have that kind of motivation, it's pretty easy to just go straight forward and enjoy yourself. I also, I'm going to start off with our first photo with my favorite piece of James trivia, which is that you met your wife in high school show choir. That's very true. It is very, very true. Uh, <laughs> high school, high school show choir. Um, I was 16. She was, yeah, yeah, I was 16 and she was, she was 14 at the time. So I was, you know, and uh, we just became really, really good friends. You know, it really wasn't anything romantic. We were literally just best friends. Like she was the person I could just talk to and kick it with. And uh, then it grew um, to what it is today. And she's still my best friend. And we've been together for 19 years, uh, January 12th. We've been married for 19 years. It's crazy, you know. And I, and, I, and I know it's 19 years without even reading the picture. See, I'm good. I'm really good. <laughs> and her name is Dawn. Yes, it now, is. Now, does she still sing? That's the big you part. know what she she does when we're in, we're in the car or we're in the house she'll still sing um she actually has a great voice uh she will not sing in public i that, but that's also the same reason why i won't do science in public she's a scientist and now you know i'm i'm not doing that i'm not crazy but she has a great <laughs> voice if, if you know if i ever if i ever forced her like you have to do this babe and she would do it she'd kill me later and she'd sound great but you know that's she's not a big person about being in the public eye she lets you do that yeah yeah, which is crazy because um, I, what I think is funny, uh, my wife was not, um, the only time at, before 2014, you could not find a picture of her on the internet. You could not. Hmm. Um, the only, you could type her name in and it would be there for two papers that she wrote. And uh, she wrote with a, with a group of people. So she wrote you know, those papers and that's how you would know. But it wasn't until I got nominated for a Tony and she was on the Tonys and then she was like, oh my God. I was like, her anonymity is gone. And she still teases me about that. She still teases, she was like, I was good. No one knew what I looked like or anything until that. And I was like, I, I love you, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They showed her during your acceptance speech. Yes. And she, she's gotten used to it because now she's in the, she's been on The View before. Uh, we've done other TV things before. So now it's, it's, we were, she was in the New York Times. So now nothing we can do now. People know who she is. She walks down the street. And I'm not even there. They're like, oh, that's James's wife, Dawn. And she's like, Ugh. she's really nice. She's like, oh, hi, hi. She's like, people recognize me. I'm like, I'm sorry. I love you. <laughs> I love it. We're having some stories pop up in the chat. I'm going to read a couple of them off um, because some of some people watch the show later on YouTube and they don't see the chat. Yeah. And also some people don't have Hold chat on. my mom, my mom, my mom is <gasps> trying to correct me. Mom, no, I did not meet Don in junior high. You told me about her in junior high. I didn't meet her till she was a freshman <laughs> in high school. You told my mom, she was, Don was my, in my mom's class. And you told me, mom, you said, hey, there's this girl, this real tall girl named Don. She's coming to Mount Eden. You should be nice to her. And so I was, and I met her. And Don and I always argue about where we first met. I say we met in the library. She says we met in the hall. That story goes away. But mom, you told me about her in junior high, but we actually met in high school. I didn't get to meet her then, but it's okay. I love my mother. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Did you actually sing a duet together? Actually, you know what? Uh, no, we've never really. Actually, it's not true. We Don and I have done karaoke together. We've done karaoke. We've sent. We've sung. We've sung some songs together. So that that that's when we usually do it. I love it. I love it. 
We've got a comment from Marie in the chat who said, I'm a teacher in the Bay Area and James is a longtime friend of my student's parents. He brought me backstage when I saw Hamilton in New York. Oh, nice. Oh, thank you, Marie. That's awesome. Thank you. Nice. And for those of us who don't know, tell us where you grew up. I know you're very I grew up. I grew up in Hayward, California. That is my home. Uh, my mom lives there. My brother lives there. Uh, most of my family still lives in the Bay, uh, or at least around there, whether it be Oakland or whether it be, uh, you know, just Sacramento, or whatever. This in the Bay Area. That's where. That's my home. Now, I always tell people. People go, "Oh, you you've been in New York for how long?" And I've been in New York for over a decade. But I am not a New Yorker. I am a Californian who works in New York, and I always know that I'm a Californian whenever winter hits. I can't stand it. I don't. I don't like snow. I don't. Oh God! And then, and I get and I realize it. And everybody knows it because I have this wonderful, amazing uh, social media battle with a friend of mine named Javier Munoz. He's he was the other. He was the alternate Hamilton with Lynn, and he and I go back and forth on Twitter every summer and every winter. We just are ruthless to each other because he loves the winter and I hate it. But I am the California boy to my soul. I miss round table pizza. I miss Jack in the Box. I miss uh, La Pinata, uh, Mexican restaurant that is over in San Leandro and in Hayward. There's so many things in the Bay that I miss, but I am so blessed to be where I am. But yes, California is is definitely our home. Uh, and we've got lots of great memories of you being in shows in the Bay Area. I thought it. Thank you photo here that I like. Ah, that yes. one's in the Bay Area. <laughs> yes, yes it is. That was actually uh, my last show. I think my last show in the Bay right before Aladdin. Um, that was Big River with Theater Works. And uh, right before th that, that was right before I went um, to go start working on, actually that's not true. There was one other show I did. Um, uh, I did Sweet Charity. So it was the, uh, Big River, then Sweet Charity. And then I started working on Aladdin. Here in the chat, we say, uh, Jacob Marker. Hi, Jacob. My family and I saw James as Sweetie Todd and then oh. as the Cowardly Lion and the Wizard of Oz with a family friend. Oh, good stuff. <laughs> yeah, Sweetie Todd. I didn't see that show, but I heard great things about that. That was so much fun because that was always that was always one of my favorite uh, shows uh, growing up in high school. I learned about it in high school. Uh, my, my teacher, Mr. Ken Rowden, told me about this show. And I was like fascinated by that you could write a musical about something about a subject matter like that. And so I went looking for it and I found, you know, I found the classic uh, film with um, with uh, Angela Lansbury and I can't and not not Lou Cario because Lou Cario is the uh, George Hearn. George Hearn did it. And I saw it and I was I just fell in love with it. And so I tried to get everything I could. And so when I was doing shows at Foothill. Um, Jay Manley came to me and first of all, he said, let's do Showboat. We did Showboat, which was a success. We did Ragtime, which was a success. And then he said, I want to do a third show with you. So I thought he was going to continue the trilogy and do, um, oh gosh, I can't, uh, um, Parade. I thought he was going to do Parade. He's like, yeah, actually, no, I want to do, I want to do Sweeney Todd. And I was like, oh, I would love to play the Beatle. And he was like, no, 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 I want you to play Sweeney. And I was like, oh, what? And it was one of those first times that I, uh, that someone was able to, uh, look at, look past, the 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 regular style of casting and non traditionally cast me in that role and we had a great time we had a fantastic time and the cast was great it was a very small house we didn't do it in the big theater we did it in the black box theater so we were really close so I was mm -hmm. slicing and spitting all over the front row and it was great and people kept coming back you know the fact that they watched me do that and still came back for more was great and also <laughs> we we served pies intermission so I think people also came for the singing but they also came for the food which was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh what kind of pies did you serve they served they served meat pies and they also served they served savory pies and sweet pies as well so you could like you know do you pick and choose which one you want i couldn't yeah, eat anything yeah. because you know trying to sing that trying to sing that score while eating i was like no i always ate light right before i went on I, then i would eat you would literally find my arlene hood said it i would find myself in um at La Pinata Mexican restaurant afterwards. And you'll hear me use, probably say that place a lot. It's one of my favorites and I pretty much live there. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many cool things coming up in the chat. I'm not even gonna try to say them all. I'm just gonna look at them and enjoy them later. I but see, I see, I see Kate, I see Kate, I see Kate and Pap. Yes, because Caitlin and I, we also, we did show about together. So that's where, I, that's where we met. Oh, so nice. that was, and I've known Caitlin and I, we've been friends for 19 years as well. So because of Caitlin? that show, so yeah. Oh, and Arlene, cool. Arlene, Hood, Arlene Hood and I worked together many, many years ago from Cal State Hayward all the way on to being friends to this day. So it's, uh, I love the fact that, you know, the Bay Area has so many amazingly talented folks. I always tell people in New York, I was like, the Bay Area has this, has the, the, the skill of actors that could easily have come to New York if they wanted to, but they decided to, you know, use their skills to teach or, to, or create or create theater out there. And I always tell people, I said, don't, 
when I talk to students, I always tell them, don't get so wrapped up and I have to be in New York. I have to be in New York. I was like, create theater wherever you are. As long mm-hmm. as you're doing mm-hmm. it and you give your all, you, it's amazing what you're going to do. I mean, good God, Moreau High School put on some, put on some um, musicals that would rival some of the stuff I've seen out here. And these people were high school kids. So Arlene, I give much props to Arlene Hood. <laughs> Thank you, James. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you're so welcome, girl. That's awesome. I just see all these nice things. Yeah, I see Kit Wilder saying you'd cast James in anything. Well, oh, yeah. Kit, that's, that's, that, that's my man. I mean, Kit and I, you know, we're thick as thick. We, and Kit and I have only done one show together. We only did one show together, but it was such a wonderful and amazing opportunity to do Jesus Christ Superstar at that time, especially at that time in my career. Um, I, I had already done a show at um, Pacific Light Opera before they became Broadway by the Bay. I did Guys and Dolls. So I was in college and I played Benny South Street. And then Jesus Christ Superstar came up and I auditioned and I, you know, didn't know if I was going to get it, but I really wanted to, you know, throw my hat in the, you know, throw my name in the hat and see what happens. And I got chosen and I heard I got with Kit Wilder and I knew of Kit because Kit was like, you know, big stuff in the base. I was like, the fact that he was Jesus and I was coming up as his like, you know, young and nobody. I was like, oh, please let me be able to hold my own with this brother. And then we met. And we just clicked the first day we clicked. And from that moment on, we have just been, been been partners and we had a great time. And also there's something about that music. There's something about when you first hear that guitar lick of if you can't get hype off that, something is wrong with you. Something is wrong with you. And <laughs> Kit and I had the best time. I think, I think that was the first time that we actually saw a director who is one of the most even keel most poised ladies in the world damn near pull her hair out because kit and i are a lot to handle i chew the scenery and so does kit so to have us both on there was just like beavers with just a pile of wood we went nuts so (laughs) the fact that she didn't shoot us both is nothing but just a great you know speaking to her patience with two two guys like us And those of you who don't know Kit, I don't know if there's anybody on this call that doesn't know Kit, but <laughs> Kit was, was our uh, one of our, our, our associate artistic director. He's our grant writer. He's an actor, director, and you've seen him on this show, uh, dissecting Hamlet and other things. So I, I saw, it. I got to see, I got to see Kit in Rocky Horror Picture Show, and there's nothing like seeing your friend in some six inch heels and some thigh highs. It, it just makes you look at him in a whole, I, I respected that brother in a whole different, there it is. <laughs> That night, I he walked out. That was like, you know, that's a man. That that's that's a man right there. That's that that brother. He's he's got he 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 is strong. That that's a that's a dude, and I I love him for it. And now deep down, I wish I had I could play that role someday. I may be too old, but every we kid that I was like, you know, I want to do it now because Kit Kit gave me the bravery to step out and do that mess. So I would love to. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, I guess we should talk a little bit about Broadway. You think? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Let's go. <gasps> Who has heard of this show? Oh my God. <laughs> now I hear that you are just a little tiny fan of Disney and animation and comic books and all of just, those things. Just a little, just a little. You have a, a little Batman little. tattoo. Did I see that? You've got a Batman tattoo? Yes, on my, on my left shoulder, I have a Batman tattoo. It was my 30th birthday uh, present to myself. And uh, I always wanted it. My wife always said, look, if you want to get a tattoo, you know, wait 10 years. If you still want it 10 years from now, get it. So when I was 20, I told her about it. And when I was 30, we got it. But I'm a huge uh, Disney fan. I became a Disney fan when my dad took me to uh, the drive-in in Union City, which is no longer exists. Union City Drive-In, we went and saw The Jungle Book. And that was, that was it for me. I heard Phil Harris sing uh, Bare Necessities. And I was like, I don't know what this is, but whatever this is, I, I want to be a part of this. And I must find out how this all works and so i've been a fan of uh animation and all the voices behind it and always wanted to do it and then i remember when i was 17 you know my worlds kind of clashed i was like in show choir trying to figure out what i was going to do with my um with my life you know going to college i was very upset with school because you know i was a teenager and i was like didn't like stuff so i was on the brink of literally literally becky on the brink of rather being a professional wrestler or going into R&B music. That's how I was like, you know, musical theater was not in the, not in there. I was like, nah, I'm not gonna do that because you know, my dad acts and my mom sings, I'm gonna do something different. So I was gonna be a professional wrestler or this. And then um, for my 17th birthday, my mom took me to see Aladdin and it was everything I loved. It was Disney, it was music, it was uh-huh. stand-up comedy with Robin Williams. It was the music of uh, Alan Menken and uh, Howard Ashman. And then that was when I auditioned for college 
and I got in as a music major. And it was kind of like when the world said, okay, this is what you're supposed to do. And it just all clicked. But I remember that particular movie just stayed with me. And for years, my wife and I would drive to Disneyland and we would go see the Aladdin Spectacular. And it was a 45 minute show um, in Disneyland of Aladdin. And my friends were auditioning for it. And when I was doing ragtime at, th at Theater Works, um, they were auditioning uh, for that show, but they were only auditioning African-American men for Jafar. And so my friend was like, hey, do you want to audition? And I was like, no, because if I do this, I don't want to play Jafar. I want to be genie. And I, and I know my own ego. Sometimes you have to, you have to be self-aware. I knew I couldn't stand there and watch someone play genie when I'm playing the straight guy. That's just not me. So I let, <laughs> I let the dream go, never thinking it was going to be anything. And um, I got the great opportunity to uh, be in uh, Memphis, um, also in, at Theater Works in 2004, and it went all the way to Broadway. Well, while we were doing it, um, I was like all other Broadway fans, even the folks on Broadway, we still go on Broadway World and Broadway.com to see what's going on because we're all fans. So I went on Broadway.com and they happened to be advertising for Aladdin being done in Seattle. And I immediately called the folks mm. in Seattle because Memphis was just done in Seattle. So I was like, hey, what is this? Is it Disney? What's, what's going on? Long story short, uh, basically, I got an audition, and I only got an audition because the director, and who I just who I spoke to today, Casey Nicola, uh, he was directing Book of Mormon, and he could not find someone to play Genie. He had auditioned many, many people and couldn't find anybody. And two of his actors, actually three, Asma Rett, uh, G Gia Michael, and um, John Eric Parker, he asked me, he said, I'm looking for a guy to play, uh, you know, the genie. And they were like, have you talked to James Iglehart? Because they knew what big Disney nerds I, I was. And they also knew, you know, I, just, I love being absolutely insane and silly. And, and because of that, Casey checked out Memphis and his people said, yeah, bring him in. And the rest is history. So I got to wow. live out my dream because some other, you know, that's also the thing about being, you have to be nice in this business. If you're nice, it's amazing how many people will, you know, push your, push your name forward. <laughs> mm. And you are obviously that. <laughs> I do my best. I do my I do my best. So how do you how did you approach the role of Aladdin? Yeah, the role of Aladdin, the role of genie, considering oh, yeah. uh, such an iconic. Yeah, yeah, that because you had seen Robin Williams or heard Robin Williams, and and this is a role you always want to play. How do you make it your own when you get a role? Actually, like that? I got I got two really cool passes. Um, by uh, Jonathan Freeman, who's the original voice of Jafar in the film. If you've ever heard the voice of Jafar in English at all, it is Jonathan Freeman. So if you go to the parks, if you play the games, if you watch the animated uh, uh, TV show on the afternoon, it is always Jonathan Freeman. He still does it to this day. Whenever they do the ice shows, it's always Jonathan. Jonathan and I were sitting back and I was like, look, man, I'm so glad to get this role, but I'm really kind of... Uh, you know, nervous about playing this role. And he said, well, you know, the genie wasn't meant to be Robin Williams. It was meant to be an African-American guy. That's what Howard wanted because Howard had based the character off of um, Cab Calloway and Fats Waller. If you listen to the music in Aladdin, all of Genie's music is big band. Everybody else has Alan Menken style music. But if you listen to Genie, all of his stuff is big band music. And so he was meant to do that. But what happened was when Howard passed away, Howard was kind of like Walt Disney. All the ideas were in Howard's head. So Howard kind of could steer a story in a certain direction. And when he passed away, they kind of lost that direction. So the two, two the uh, Ron and I can't, I'm going to get killed. I know Annalise is probably laughing her head off because she probably knows both names. But Ron and his partner who directed the film, um, they went in a different direction and they got... Um, Mr. Goldberg, and he had this idea of, he was listening to Robin Williams on a, on a, um, on a album and he animated this, this stick that Robin did. And they said, let's do this. And they showed it to Robin and Robin said, yes. And the rest is history. So when he came to me and told me that this was Howard's original idea, I kind of went, okay, now I can step out of Robin's, not Robin's shadow, but just kind of do it my own way because this is the way they kind of wanted it to go. So you have to be genie-esque. I can't not take some of the things that Robin did, but not be Robin Williams, but be James Iglehart doing genie-esque things. Robin, it, the genie isn't exactly Robin Williams, but it's very, it's most of his personality. So if I would put my personality into the genie, hopefully the same type of um, response would happen. And so that's what ended up happening. So between Howard and Jonathan, you know, it all worked out. And then uh, when it was all over, Howard's, Howard Ashman's sister came to me one night, she came to see the show and she was like, I just want you to know, and it, this blew me away. She was like, I just want you to know, you're playing the genie the way Howard envisioned it. And oh. I, I, I was in tears. Just oh. that, that just threw me. I was, it just, there's those moments where you're just not expecting that kind of blessing and that's what it was. Mm -hmm. So 
And also I kind of looked at it as I'm going to do what I think is funny and hopefully the audience digs it. Like, you know, I, I know the silly things I would do in the grocery store to my wife. Like I'm, I'm the guy who, if there's props around, I will use them. So we can't go into a 7-Eleven <laughs> because I will take fly swatters and start doing things. I will take gloves <laughs> and start, you know, that, that, you know, nothing can't take grocery stores is nothing but a prop show for me. So I will do things to her and she knows that. And um, she said, take all of that silliness and do that on stage. And so during rehearsals, I would just go nuts and just say things. There's so many, there were so many, so many things I did in rehearsals that are so much funnier than I did that are actually on stage when we couldn't do it because Disney was like, yeah, you can't say that. <laughs> no, you can't, you can't, you can't do that either. So I, I like when we were in Seattle, I had brought in all kinds of, I had basically just ripped on all of the Disney movies. And they were like, that's funny. You cannot say that when we get to Broadway, you cannot do that. <laughs> so I was like, okay, fine. So we were able to keep it down and make it, you know, you know, in, in what you see, which was still great, thank God. But you know, the stuff we did in rehearsals were way funnier than what we did on stage. <laughs> I love it. I'm thinking of whose line is it anyway? Like I'd love to throw you up there with Ryan Styles. And it's actually, across. it's actually, you know, it was kind of like that because we had two guys on stage with me, guy Brian Gonzalez and um, Don Daryl Rivera who played uh, Babcack and also Iago. We're three guys who improv is our specialty. Mm -hmm. And after our first run in Seattle, Casey Nicola found a way for the three of us to not be in any scenes together. He, yeah, he systematically <laughs> wrote away for the three of us to, if we were in scenes together, we may say one line to each other and that was it. He did not want the three of us on stage <laughs> together ever because we would take over the show. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, yeah, you guys are in the show, but you got, no, y'all can't be, no, no way. Okay, my face hurts from smiling. <laughs> This is the most fun interview. <laughs> yes, Ron, Ron Clemens and John Musker. Thank you, Annalisa. I knew she was going to say that. That's my little sister. So I knew she, and she's a, she's a Disney aficionado. So I'm glad she's here to help me out. I love it. I love it. I, I think I mentioned that the vlog that you had for Jeannie. And there's this great moment. You had just met Whoopi Goldberg and yes. you were still, oh, gosh. And you were totally starstruck. I, well, it's, it's a moment because like <laughs> I, I met her at the show that story is crazy too, because um, when I was in college, um, you know, I was watching all kinds of theater. And um, when I was a little kid, I was about I was about 13, 14, and my mom, I really wanted to watch Richard Pryor. And Richard Pryor is way too dirty for, you know, someone who's that age. But my my dad said, you know, he let me see Richard Pryor on Saturday Night Live. And Richard Pryor on Saturday Night Live, he was doing his shtick, but he was doing it without any of the cuss words and stuff like that. And so I just got, fell in love with Richard's stuff. And, you know, this is before Saturday Night Live would write the monologues for their stars. They had comedians step up and they would do their own shtick. So he did his, kind of his one man show and he talked to different characters, but it was just him doing it, which I was fascinated with. Fast forward a couple of years later, I'm watching HBO and I, and when I was about 16, 17, and I see... Uh, Whoopi Goldberg do her one woman show from Broadway, Whoopi on Broadway, that Mike Nichols directed. And I was enthralled. It was the most amazing thing I had ever seen. I had never seen anybody take a story and one person just do it like that. And so between Richard and her and Robin Williams and Billy Crystal and Bill Cosby, I won't lie, I know Peter, that's a bad name to say, but I, I'm looking for his work, not life. But, you know, to look at him and watch what he did, I was just like, this is amazing to me so I was always in love with solo shows so I would I followed Whoopi's career so we here we are we're doing Aladdin and Thomas Schumacher who's the president of Disney Theatrical he walks up to me he goes just want you to know Whoopi Goldberg's here and like because I you know he goes I know some people don't like to know if people's here I'm like no no please tell me because that gives me a chance to like really show out if I know who's here and he was like um yeah you know Whoopi's here so I just went crazy I went nuts and I was calling her out and things like that and so I get backstage and when she sees me she goes to her knees and like bows to me and I burst oh. Becky I burst into tears like oh. absolute I lost it completely and when she gets oh. up she says what's wrong and I said you don't understand how much you mean to me when I was in college mm -hmm. we did one acts and uh, one of the one acts that we did I chose well the director chose because I asked her to we did her version of Fontaine which is this character she has from her one woman show mm -hmm. and I did it and I did the whole her whole shtick and it was nothing like you know I, I'm tw I'm 19 20 years old doing Whoopi Goldberg shtick, cussing up a sailor, cussing like a sailor. My mom's in the audience and she's just like, oh my God, clutching pearls like my son is cussing like that. Uh, but I was living my life, you know? So to get to tell her that she 
meant that much to me. And then she looks at me and she goes, you are good. You are amazing. We're going to get you on The View. And the fact that I was able to not only go to The View to co-host once, I got to co-host three times and then be yeah. on The View for my farewell. Whoopi facilitated my farewell from Aladdin on The View. So oh. she means a great deal to me. And to have someone like that uh, have your back and just be sweet to you. We don't talk every day. We ain't the best of friends, but she's the sweetest person. Whenever I see her, she finds a way to bring me to wherever she is. You know, she called me. I got to my, my family and I. We got to go see her her one woman show when she was out uh, out here in, in Connecticut. So she's just a wonderful spirit, and I will always. She's one of those people that you know when you when they say you don't want to meet your heroes, that's wrong. I got to meet my hero, and she was absolutely fantastic. She seems like she would be. She seems yeah. so genuine. I'm so yeah, glad. What you, see, what you see on The View is what you get. Actually, she's being nice on The View. <laughs> <laughs> the real, real Whoopi is real raw. She is no joke. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to ask about people you've sort of been in awe of who you've gotten to meet in your career and then work with. And I'm sure she's not the only one. I'm oh, sure there's no, I mean, but, you know, first stories. of all, first of all, to get to work with Jonathan Freeman was a dream. You know, I got to pick his brain about, you know, animation, how it worked. I'll never forget meeting. Uh, there's a guy named Chuck Cooper. Chuck Cooper won the Tony for the life in, I believe, 1996. And I, he was the, he and Brian Stokes Mitchell were the first like real baritones I heard on Broadway. Most of the guys were tenors and to hear, to see these two African-American men sing like that, I wanted to sing like them. And so I found every piece of music that Chuck Cooper sang and I used all that for my auditions. Like, and I got many roles in the Bay using Chuck's music. So when I got to do the Wiz, uh, at City Center in New York in 2009, uh, Don Lewis, who is known for uh, Different World and all these, she wrote the music for it and all that kind of stuff. Um, she, she's also plays the mom in uh, Tina, the musical. Uh, she says, hey, I'm going out to lunch with Chuck. Do you want to come? And I was like, oh, Chuck over. So we get to lunch and I see Chuck and I said, okay, um, hi. He goes, hey man, nice to meet you. And I said, okay, I need you to give me five minutes to geek out and then I will turn into professional <laughs> again. I just need five minutes. And I completely geeked out. I was like, I used to sing your songs and I was this and then meet you and all the guy. And I saw you with Tony and I literally get, and he just kind of sat there chilling. <laughs> and Chuck is real cool. He was like, well, listen, young blood, it's really good that you enjoyed my work. And I was like, he's so cool. And he <laughs> sees me and he calls, <laughs> He calls me Youngblood whenever, whenever we, we see each other. And then I remember meeting Brian Stokes Mitchell for the first time. And Brian Stokes Mitchell is labeled in, on Broadway as the last leading man. Like that's what they call him. And he is like, I mean, Cole House and Ragtime. I mean, you know, Kiss Me Kate. I mean, uh, you know, a man of La Mancha. I mean, this is Brian Stokes Mitchell. And I met him and I literally became tongue tied. The way that, the way that girls, <laughs> When they see BTS, that's how I was when I met Brian. So I was like, hi, you are Brian Stokes Mitchell. And he was like, hey, you're James Eichelhorn. And I was like, you know who I am? I completely geeked out. And now when I see him, I'm like, I try to be cool. I'm like, oh, what's up, Stokes? He's like, Eichelhorn. And, and I still walk away. Like, I've, I've had friends with me, other actors. And they'll go, Brian Stokes Mitchell calls you Eichelhorn. I'm like, yeah, he's, he's my man. We, we call, we, we talk, we chill, you know. So to meet Chuck Cooper or Brian Stokes Mitchell or... To meet some of my professional wrestling heroes, I got to meet Mick Foley, AKA Mankind, AKA Cactus Jack. I got to meet, I can't believe I can actually say I am friends with Dave Batista, who plays Drax in um, the Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, I, I know that guy, like we talk all the time, or Becky Lynch, you know, women's champion. Like we, 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 I talk to these people and it trips me out when I, to meet, to meet Ron Clemens and John Musker, to meet the guys who created, you know, Aladdin. I mean, to to meet these folks and they're just down to earth people. To get to meet Ben Vereen, the guy who, mm. Ben Vereen is the, are the shoulders that most of the brothers that do what we do stand on. Without him, we wouldn't be, he's the first Judas, you know? I mean, he's the leading player in Pippin. This man basically created what it was to be, you know, an African-American on Broadway, you know, the, tr the triple threat. So to get to meet these folks and to see that they're all really down to earth basically showed me um, how I was supposed to conduct myself. I think one of my favorites was meeting Andre DeShields who won the Tony um, just recently. And he was, the, he was the original whiz and he was, he just won again. And so he also was another one to look at me and kind of like, 
guide me and how to act, you know, as being an actor in this business and how to, how to, you know, how to conduct myself and just to have those guys around and have these people around and be able to meet them and know that it's okay. I mean, I, I, I tripped out when I met Audra McDonald and then she's nuts, her and LaShawn's, you know, they are the most amazing <laughs> leading ladies in the world. But like I said, like Whoopi Goldberg, you know, when the camera's off, those are real ladies. They are no joke. And, and it's just kind of cool when we all get to, like, when I say we all get to kick it together, you're like, wow, I'm in this group with these people, especially being blessed to have won a Tony. I'm in this, I'm in this group with these folks. And it, it's still, you know, I always say the minute this, the minute this doesn't feel like it's magic, I'll stop. And this still feels like magic to me. This still feels like Disneyland. Whenever I go, when I'm walking out 42nd Street and I see people, when I'm on, or when I'm on stage, I'm like, I'm on Broadway. That's, this is crazy. I used to dream about this. I used to sit in my house or my girlfriend's house, Dawn's house, when I was, you know, a teenager and watch the Tonys and go, hey, you know, this is, I want to be there and I'm there. And that, that feeling never goes away, you know. I love interviewing people who just glow when they talk about what they do. I mean, just to, like how fortunate must you feel to be part of this world? I, I feel blessed. And, you know, and I have to give credit to, you know, my mom, my mom and my dad. My mother uh, knew I wanted to do this and she was totally supportive. My mom made a lion costume for me when I was a kid. And I sang <laughs> Mino Lion at the church talent show. And then to be able to grow up and do the lion on, in New York. You know, come on. Uh, my, you know, my dad did characters in, in at dinner and breakfast and lunch and everywhere we went. Um, you know, he would do these kind of things. And so I kind of learned coming up, you know, this way. My parents were very real with me. They let me know that this was a hard business to get in. It was not going to be easy. They let me know I had to have a tough skin. I'll never forget being in college and auditioning for something and not getting it and coming home and just crying. Just, I ah, me, just baby crying at my mother. <laughs> She let me cry for about two minutes and she said, hey, hey, get it together. If you go just cry every time something don't go your way, maybe you shouldn't do this. And I was like, but I love this. She said, well, you need to get a thick skin. You can't cry every time you don't get something. And I was like, huh, well, that's uh, not exactly the, what I was expecting her to say, but that makes perfect sense. So I need to get myself together so I can do this. So, <laughs> you know, they're very, they're very real with me about what this business was. And uh, I'm, I'm glad and blessed to have been able to, you know, keep doing it. Oh, that's wonderful. Hey, let's talk a little bit about Hamilton cool. and freestyle love supreme. I'm yes. going to another great photo here. <laughs> Lafayette. Uh, so it was 2017 that you joined Hamilton, right? Yes, it's true. Yes. Well, 2017 is when I joined the Broadway company. But you go way back with Hamilton. I go way, I go way back with Hamilton. Hamilton and I, uh, Hamilton and I go way, Hamilton and I are, I've been, in, I've been a part of Hamilton family the same amount of time I've been a part of the Aladdin family. So um, I've, been, I've been a part of Freestyle of Supreme for the past 13 now, 2020, 14 years, which is nuts to think about um, that I've known these brothers for that long. And one day I'm at In the Heights, I'm walking around looking for Chris Jackson because we're boys and I was the man, best man at his wedding. So I'm walking, I'm getting ready to go to lunch with him. And I see Lynn and Lynn says, hey, I got this cool idea that I'm doing. And when I go, oh, well, what is it? He goes, I'm reading this book. And he shows me this thick book with uh, this white guy on the front. And he's like, this is Hamilton. I'm like, yeah, who is that? He's like, the guy on the $10 bill. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's good, whatever. He's like, I got this idea to turn this into a mixtape. I want to get like Busta Rhymes and like Eminem and like Common. I'm like, that sounds awesome. And I can't wait to hear it. A couple of months later go by, he's writing. And he says to me, he says, you know, kind of about a year ago by. And he says, listen, man, I get to do this um, concert at Lincoln Center. And I was going to do In the Heights, but I asked, could I do, you know, Hamilton instead? And I want you to be a part of it. I wrote this part for you. I want you to play Mulligan. And it's, can you, how's your Busta Rhymes impression? And I was like, oh, my Busta Rhymes is pretty dope. Let's, let's go for it. So I got to be a part of that cast with uh, Gavin Creel, Chris Jackson, uh, Mandy Gonzalez, uh, Karen Olivo, um, Utkarsh Imbakar, John Rua, some amazing people, you know, Alex Lacamoire was the musical director, Shockway was there, Bill Sherman was there, all these guys who would become these Tony Award winning, Grammy Award winning, Oscar Award winning, P Emmy Award winning people. We didn't know, we were all just like broke ass people back then. <laughs> so we're doing the show and we knew then that this was gonna be something. We didn't know it was, was gonna be this big thing, but that same night that we did that concert, Casey Nichol is in the audience and he calls me and he goes, hey, we just got the, we, we got the almost green light for Aladdin. We just have to do this one little demo for Bob Iger. And I'm like, who's Bob Iger? And he's like, the president of Disney. And I was like, 
that's going to be fun. So um, then what's funny is a couple of weeks later, Tommy calls me and he says, hey, we're going to be doing um, this out of town reading of Hamilton. Do you want to be Mulligan? I know you just did Genie. What do you think? And I was like, dude, I just did Genie. I really had a good time with it. I think I'm gonna stick with this. And he said, I totally understand, man. Ride it out, go do your thing. So they go off to do their thing. I go off to do mine. Everything works out well for the genie and all that kind of stuff. I'm doing it. I get, I call, they call me and say, hey, you wanna go to opening night of Hamilton? I go to opening night of Hamilton. I'm kicking it with them. The Roots play. We still can't believe the Roots played. I mean, they did a whole concert. And then I'm like, great. My friends are on Broadway. I'm on Broadway. We all kick it every night. There's one time where Chris Jackson and I are walking in the street and it's George Washington and the genie and we got mobbed and we realized <laughs> we can't walk down New York streets together anymore. That is dangerous. We should go secretly and eat in the theater because it was a time where both shows were really, really hyped. And that was the first time we ever felt what fans felt like. We were like, this is fun. Not really. We really just wanted to eat burritos and let's go back. So we ran. <laughs> um, then while I'm in... Um, doing the genie and having a great time. And it's, a, I realized it's about my time to go. I get a call from Tommy and he says, hey, do you want to come back to the ham fam? And I said, sure, that, that'd be great. And he goes, I'm not going to lie to you. You still have to audition. And it's nothing like we're friends, but business is business and friends are friends. So when it came time to audition, I got myself together. They sent me a packet that was literally this big. It was all the music. I had to sing uh, all of my shot by myself. I had to do, cause I also asked to audition for Burr. So I did all of Burr's music and I did all of um, Jefferson Lafayette's music and nothing like, nothing like intimidation when you walk into an audition room and there's Wayne Brady. Wayne Brady <laughs> sitting at the other end of the room. And I was like, wow, please tell me he's here for a commercial or a movie. And he's like, hey, yeah, man, I'm here for Hamilton. I'm like, ah, great, wow. that's amazing. <laughs> so he goes in and sings first. And then I was like, you know what? I, I'm dope. I've won a Tony. I know what I'm doing. Let's do this. So I go in and I say, he, co he I come out, he goes, wow, you, yeah. And I was like, yeah, man, I'm James Lagarde. I'm Wayne Brady. And we became friends then. And they, they called Wayne for Chicago and they called me for Broadway. And uh, I've been with it ever since. And it's been, um, it's been a wonderful learning curve because with Aladdin, uh, you're shot out of a cannon. And with Hamilton, it is a slow burn. It is a fast moving train, but it's a train that doesn't stop. It, like at least in Aladdin, you know, I have time to kind of think, I mean, I can kind of improv my way through. Once you are in on the Hamilton train, if you miss it, you just yeah. missed it. You got to jump back on. But it's oh, yeah. a, and it's also a, an amazing phenomenon because it is a phenomenon. It's nothing like uh, people know the words to friend like me, but we changed some things for Broadway. Hamilton, the Hamilton fans know this thing by heart. So you'll start rapping or start singing and look out in the audience and people, we call them the auditioners. They'll be in the front row and they'll be singing with you. Not lip syncing, singing with you. <laughs> so I'm doing, I'm taking this host butter rings, make a dead coach, and they're going, I'm taking this host butter rings, make a record. You're like, wow, I can hear you. That's amazing. Also, it's one of those shows, it's a hoodwink where you, you the people you expect to know the show don't and the people you don't expect i think one of my favorite moments is i literally saw a lady i kid you not i literally saw a lady who looked like a modern version of june cleaver for those people who don't know who june cleaver is she is the mom of the old show called the beaver check it out it's real fun <laughs> leave it to beaver and uh, she has she's there with her white dress and her white pearls and she's kicking it and all of a sudden we got to and if you don't know now you know she was like and if you don't know now you know and i was like the, you know, totally. I mean, this this lady, this is terrible to say. This white woman was a hip hop head. She knew it. When she came backstage, she was like, "Oh my god, I grew up on this. I knew Red Man and Method Man and Biggie." And I was like, "Didn't see it coming. Didn't see it coming." Because there were two black kids next to her who were just sitting there like they were at Phantom of the Opera. They were like, "Yes, this is a wonderful show. I love this. This is beautiful." I like it. so to see this like to see this this difference of what Hamilton will bring to the audience is so much fun for us, and it's such a it's such a powerhouse of a show that touches people so strongly that it's been a wonderful journey to kind of watch where it's gone and I and mm. also how comfortable I have become in the show. So yeah, it's it's been a great journey to see what my friends have created and to be a part of the history of it. Of course, of course. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, on that same blog, uh, everyone, if you haven't seen it, you should go to, it's on broadway.com. James has this blog, I Dream of Jeannie, and it's backstage yes. stuff. But in that first episode, there's this great moment when you were backstage for a freestyle Love Supreme show. And yeah. there's Lynn Manuel, and there's Christopher Jackson, and, you're, and you guys are just freestyling away in the well, dressing room. I, awesome. I would have to leave Aladdin and then go do a show with freestyle. 
So I would still be, I would do do as much as I could to take all the sparkles off, but most of the time I couldn't. I was just still glittery. <laughs> so I would go there and I was like, and that was our warm up. And so I said, hey guys, can I record our warm up for you know Broadway.com? Can we do this? And they were like, yeah, cool, let's do this. And what you see is what you get. Those brothers are like that. We are, it's amazing. We came, it's one of those moments when I think of Free Still of Supreme of, you know, um, we started from the bottom, now we hear, you know, you know, Drake's song. And so that's how we were. We we were broke guys who loved doing this. And now we got to do it on Broadway, which is ridiculous. We never in a million years thought we would be able to improv hip hop on Broadway. I mean, the last improv show on Broadway was Mike Nichols before he was a director, you know, Mike Nichols and his partner, which I, I, I'm going to get killed for not remembering her name, but they, the, the two of them did it. They did a show where they would do sketches and improv the way through. So the next improv show was us. Uh, yes. Man, Elaine, Nichols, May, yeah. Elaine May. Thanks. Thanks. Wilder. I got people on here. Help me out. Thanks, I love yeah. that. <laughs> you know, so to have, to have our show be able to do that was awesome. And then for them to film the documentary about it, you know, we are free self supreme. It's it's documented where we came from to where we are, and when you look at the guys and the ladies in our show, and you look at the landscape of film and TV and Broadway, our 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 folks in free self supreme are a part of that. Bill Sherman, who was our uh, mu- who was our keyboard player, is the musical director for Sesame Street. Davi Diggs is one of the biggest, you know, stars in Hollywood right now. Chris Jackson, he's an Emmy Award winning writer for Sesame Street, but also other kids shows, but he's also on the CBS show Bull. Lin-Manuel is Lin-Manuel. I mean, Utkarsh has been in films. He's, uh, I mean, he's in cartoons, you know, myself, Jelly Donut, uh, Andrew, Andrew Bancroft. Some of the TV shows, some of the TV commercials you see on the Super Bowl, he wrote. You know, the, the, if you saw the one with Matthew McConaughey for the Doritos, he wrote that, he wrote this thing. So the guys in our show, you know, they are the right music for people or they have their own stuff. You know, Kayla, our beatboxer is the world champion beatboxer, literally the world champion. Shockwave is another one. Mm-hmm. You know, these guys, these, these wonderful people that are a part of our show have become these, this group of folks. And we all started together and we kind of just watched each other's um, career blossom. And then for us to all put our egos away and come back to do this eight, you know, this four month run on Broadway and still feel like we all know our place. We all know what to do. We all know Tommy's in charge. We all know when we step on stage, what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it. And nobody brings their of the career to the show. We just bring, yeah. we just bring who we are. We bring the, you know, the freestyle family and then we go off to do our other things then come back. There's nothing like walking into the dressing room and Lynn is writing musical, writing music for the Little Mermaid. <laughs> Lynn's writing music for the Little Mermaid. He goes, hey, you want to see um my scene from, uh, from the HBO show I'm doing? And I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> So I get to watch this scene and I walk in the next day and then uh, Chris is writing music. I walk in, they're like, what are you studying? I'm like, oh, I'm doing this uh, Disney cartoon. So I got to record my demo on my phone so they can have it. So we're all doing this, you know, David's upstairs recording stuff. And, and we, then we get back on stage and like, everything is cool. And we all kind of looked around and went, is this really happening? Is this, is this really what's going on? So it, you know, it's just, it's, it's a blessing, but don't get me wrong. We do have our, you know, our bad days. We are regular people, but there's that moment where you kind of look at it and you kind of go, I can either look at the bad days and go, wow, it's all terrible. I can just look how blessed I am and just shut up and be happy. You know, we've had so yeah. many great things that have happened to us. Let's just enjoy the journey and, you know, keep riding out as long as we can. Oh, that's great. I'm going to ask just one more question because I know we've got a lot of audience questions people want to ask. Um, but I want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your animation work. And first, I have to say that my four-year-old son is a big fan of Nature Cat. And so he's, he, he's, we was, he's excited that I was meeting Michael Blue Jay tonight, yes. except he thinks you're a real bird. So let's not, let's not, let's, let's not, let's not, let's not break that up. Let's not break that up. <laughs> Tell us about some of the, the things that you love the most doing an animated voiceover stuff. The, the thing I love the most about animation is the fact that you can do anything in animation. You know, one of the things I loved when I was a kid was coming, running home and watching Transformers, running home and watching G.I. Joe, running home and watching the Gummy Bears and watching Darkwing Duck and DuckTales and, you know, Saturday morning cartoons with my dad and watching the Looney Tunes and just cackling at, you know, Bugs and Daffy and Yosemite Sam and Foghorn Leghorn and all these wonderful characters. And I always was fascinated by the folks who were behind it or going to Disneyland and listening to the ghost host, which was Paul Freeze. 
and finding out that Paul Fries was not only the ghost host, but he was also the pirate in Pirates of the Caribbean. And he's also Ludwig von Drake. And he's, you know, he's also uh, a Burgermeister Meisterburger in Santa Claus is Coming to Town. When you realize that this one guy does all these voices, I was like, who are these people? So when I got the chance to step into this world, you know, one of the first things I got to do was Nature Cat. And that's Bill Sherman. Uh, Bill Sherman said, hey, man, I need you to play Michael Blue Jay. And I was like, I'm in. Let's do it. And then I was doing... <laughs> I was, I've done some other things that were kind of small, but the big thing that happened was I was doing Aladdin and this great guy named Chris Sonnenberg came to see the show. And he was there to, in New York to pitch Tangled, the animated series to Alan Menken. And Alan Menken got him and his partner tickets to see Aladdin. And while they were watching the show, Chris said, he saw me come out and he said, we have to write something for this guy. So they created Lance Strongbow for me because of what I did in Aladdin. Now, if that's not a blessing, I don't know what is. That's fantastic. So because of Lance Strongbow, the Disney animation group, the Disney, uh, Disney television animation began to see what I could do, which led to, you know, the DuckTales, which led to <laughs> um, Vampirina, which led to uh, Elena of Avalar. So it's just, and I've gotten to do some other things, which are great. I've got uh, this wonderful show called Made by Maddie for Nickelodeon, which is going to come out uh, hopefully soon. And I've got a couple others, which I can't talk about, which did Nick Jr. and stuff, Nick Jr. and also Disney Jr. and also a DreamWorks uh, 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 cartoon that's coming out. Oh, so I, I have a living, living my life right now. I, and um, what's funny is it's also helped because during the pandemic, um, I have literally, I had to build, a, I had to build, uh, my agent calls me and says, hey, can you still record? You know, you have a mic? I said, yeah, I got a mic and I got all the stuff. So in my closet, I have all this soundproof stuff and the clothes behind me. And what's funny is the clothes and the soundproof, I have the best studio in the world. People keep going, oh my God, your sound is so amazing. I'm like, yeah, you know, my, cause my jacket's here, my tie is here. It really makes sure everything sounds like professional. And I literally recorded uh, DuckTales in my closet. I recorded DuckTales in my closet. I recorded, uh, oh, there's a wonderful cartoon, which is not for children on a YouTube called Hell of a Boss. It is definitely adult boss. oriented. <laughs> yes, definitely adult oriented. I recorded that in my closet. So <laughs> it's been great. And yes, uh, Kit is absolutely right. I actually, when I was a kid, uh, my teacher, uh, Miss Dopart, I'll never forget it. I was like, I, you see how I talk a lot now. I talk a lot in class and what she would do is she would tell me if I could just chill out and be cool in class. Those weren't the words she used, but I can just be quiet. She would give me 10 minutes at the end of class and I could perform for the class. And the things I would perform would be the monologues or the scenes I saw from Looney Tunes. So I would do Duck Season or I would do all of the Barber of, of you know, Rabbit of Seville, which I know, which I will not do right now because it's too long. But yes, I, I annoy my friend every birthday with the Rabbit of Seville because I know that whole seven minute, uh, I know Rabbit of Seville and I know what's opera doc. I know it all by heart. And watching Chuck Jones's uh, takes, there's a wonderful take that Porky Pig does with in um uh, in uh, the Robin Hood sketch with uh, Daffy Duck, this great take, and I've stolen that and I've used it in shows, and I always laugh. I'm like, I'm like your comic timing, and I was like, ha ha, that is nothing but Porky Pig, and no one knows now that they know. But uh, that animation has always been a big part of my life, and I hope that I get to do it uh, until I leave this earth. It's it's the most fun. My my goal, my big goal now, is to be in a, a Disney feature film, but also also to be a part of the Warner Brothers. Um, DC Universe, DC Universe or the mm -hmm. MCU, uh, the cartoons. I love all of the Batman, uh, Superman, Justice League cartoons. Those are some of the best pieces of animation I've ever seen. And also, you know, the Avengers and all that kind of stuff. I, I love Joy. We have seven minutes to spare. How dare you? Um, but yeah, those <laughs> well, are the We can things. go longer than nine o'clock. It's okay. Sure, we don't have to great. stop right at nine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, th that's, this has been a, a lot of fun to be able to put together. Also to have Alan Menken write an original song for I got to do two original songs, one with Zachary Levi as a duet and then one on my own, uh, Bigger Than That. And I remember being a kid thinking, wow, you know, these wonderful actors got to sing original music by Alan Menken. And Alan Menken wrote a song, Alan Menken and, and Slater, Chris Slater wrote a song for me. Mm -hmm. That is the coolest thing ever. When I, I, I literally, I remember sitting, I, I cry a lot. So my wife and I were sitting back watching Disney Channel and there is Lance singing the song. And I just was like, mm -hmm. I'm singing an, I'm singing an Alan Macon tune. Or when we watched Darkwing Duck, I watched Darkwing Duck religiously in high school, religiously. And 
uh, you know, uh, Tim Curry is the original voice of Terrace Bulba, the character that I am for for Dark for Darkwing, and when I got cast in that, I, I, I remember I auditioned for Darkwing. They were looking for brothers for Darkwing and then they went a different direction and the Disney people called me and they said, we know you're such a big fan of Darkwing Duck. I mean, I literally went to the audition Becky with a Darkwing Duck shirt on and they were like, oh, you're you're a fan. I'm like, no, I know the history of this and the DuckTales, <laughs> I know this. And they were like, would you like to play Taurus Bulba? And I was like, yes, I, that's, a, that's a given. So to hear my voice come back, talking to Scrooge McDuck, a, a character I've watched since I was a kid. Wow. It was, yeah, I'm, I'm loving all of this. This is so much fun. Oh, that's fantastic. I love this so much. I got to show one more picture real, real quick. This is what I've been listening to. It's <laughs> As the Curtain Rises, Bobby's <laughs> first digital soap opera. So if you need a new podcast to listen to, I recommend it because it's hilarious. Oh, it is so, so good. It is so, so much fun. I mean, we've got, I mean, Lilius White is there. Alex Brightman is there. Uh, we just, <laughs> so stupid. We, we are so good. Sarah Stiles is there. We have some great people in this, in this wonderful show. And it's basically, if you don't know what it is, it's a, it's a soap opera about a show and two producers are producing Avatar, the musical, but they don't know that they couldn't get the rights to the actual Avatar musical. And it's all the hijinks that ensue. And I play Steve Jones, the uh, producer. And I based my character on many of the producers that I've met. And I will probably never work again once they hear this podcast. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's really funny. Thank you. All right. I'm going to stop asking questions because I know that many of you have questions to ask. So if you would like to type a question into the chat or like to turn on your camera and ask one, I think actually there was one in the chat from Kit that I haven't asked yet. Let me just scroll back here and we can start with that one. Kit has a question. James, what would be your one piece of advice to student actors and singers with big dreams and ambitions? <clears throat> What's the one thing you would tell them to do or not do and what pearls of wisdom would you share? I would tell them to believe in yourself. Uh, if, if you're already doing this, if you're already singing, if you're already dancing, if you're already acting, you know you have that skill set. And when I say you know you have that skill set, because if one person tells you you're good, okay, believe them. If two people tell you, if two people tell you you're good, okay, maybe. But if three or four people tell you you're good, that means you probably have something. So you already <laughs> have that part. That part you can learn. You can really, really learn how to do you know, this business, you know, if you're not the best singer, you know, get a, get a teacher or learn to, you know, find a place where you can, you know, hone your craft. If you're not a good dancer, take a dance class. If you need to be acting, you know, take an acting class. The thing, the hardest thing to do is to find that thing in yourself that says, I'm okay. And I'm cool without other people telling me I'm cool. I can do this. And if it's amazing how, when you believe in yourself, the folks behind the table you know, at the auditions or people that see you on the show believe in you. That is the biggest thing to get over because it's amazing how many people who aren't that talented, but they believe in themselves and doggone if they have careers. And you're like, how do you have a career? But you're, you're so fascinating because you believe in you. So I, now I believe it, you know? So it's really about, you know, that type of thing. And if I also, you know, don't be afraid to work hard and don't expect it to happen overnight. Don't expect it to happen overnight. And uh, like I said, all the other things about learning how to do it, you can get that. And the other thing is follow your own path. We, especially with social media, we see what people are doing on their, or on their Twitter, or on their Instagram, and we just assume that's the way to do it. No, there's everybody's journey is different. You're not going to have the same path as the other actors around you. And when people say, oh my God, you have to do it this way. That's not true. You don't have to do it that way. Find what over, whatever works for you and what doors will open for you. And those doors that open for you are supposed to open for you. And if they don't open, that means it wasn't for you. So don't be mad. You're like, oh, that's my part. That should have been my part. No, that part was for them. There is a part for you. And when that door opens, it's going to be exactly the magic that you're supposed to have. So I would say, uh, you know, believe in yourself, follow your own path. And, uh, you know, just, just be open to, you know, whatever this journey takes you on. Well said. I see Lisa Millette, our artistic director, has a comment. I see Hi, so. Hi. Hi, James. How are you doing, girl? What's happening? Hi. <laughs> um, I see so many great questions that I'll be very quick. But I, I, I obviously want to say thank you for sharing yourself with us no but i really I, I honestly i feel like i just i need to say that that you are a blessing that you are 
you are. You are so um, inspirational and you're still so down to earth and the Bay is so proud of you. And um, I, you are delightful and, and your gifts, the way that you express them and share them and the connections that you still have with so many people like Caitlin and Kid and me and you, um, you are the best of our craft. Like you, to me, personify the, the real artist and the real creative in, in the way that you also live your life. So I just want to thank you for that. And I just wanted to lift it up and call it out. Thank you. And also thanks for hanging with us tonight. Oh, please, My pleasure. You know that. Thank you. It means a lot. Thank you very much, Lisa. Speaking of Caitlin, Caitlin wants to know if you've ever fallen asleep while you were on stage during a live show. How dare you, Caitlin? I think there's a story there. I have uh, fallen asleep <laughs> on stage three times that I can remember. Uh, once in the Bay Area during Little Shop of Horrors, I was at the Fox Theater. Um, and uh, I was playing the plant, but at the beginning of the show, I played one of the homeless people. And so they had a pre-show where we walk out and I walked out and I sat, laid on stage and girl, I just went to sleep and I didn't wake up until the thing went, I was like, oh, oh. and I think I, I didn't, you know, I looked crazy and it was okay to look crazy because I was out. The second time I fell asleep on stage, we were doing Aladdin. I fell asleep in Aladdin twice, <laughs> once in Seattle and once on Broadway. Uh, but we were, this was, during, so we were doing previews, but so previews we were doing, it was crazy during previews during, um, in Seattle and we had this magic chair. <laughs> so this magic chair was supposed to be in the cave of wonders. And what happens is uh, Aladdin rubs the lamp, the smoke hits the chair and then boom, I pop out. So I would, uh, so I'm in the chair and I have this uh, magic thing and I put it on. And I'm going over my lines, going over my lines. And I have my eyes closed while he's, you know, singing. I'm going over my lines, going over my lines, going over my lines. And the firework woke me up. It was like, Pfft. so I didn't hear his scene. I didn't hear him get fall. And I didn't hear him fall into the cave. I didn't hear him rubbing the lamp. I woke up when the fireworks came out. And I went, oh, hello, everybody. And when it was over, I walked over to Adam. I said, please tell me I said everything. Did I say everything? Because I don't remember anything from when I sat down to when the fireworks came up and I shot out. And the second time, the third time I fell asleep on stage was during Tony time, where every day was uh, interviews and every night was the show. And then, you know, sleep, just, you know, you know, do the show, repeat, do the show, interview, repeat. So we have this moment in the show where the guys are locked up in, uh, we're about to do uh, Somebody's Got Your Back. And there's this wonderful magic moment where I appear from the, ca from, from, the, um, from the jail cell. So they put me in the thing. And again, I'm like, you know, I'm tired. And I'm like, okay, let me go over my lines. So make sure I know what I'm doing. I want to say, I had this funny joke. I'm going to say, let me say it. And the doors close and I, I'm holding on to it. And my head hits thing and I'm out, I'm out. And all of a sudden I've realized that I'm being rolled off stage and someone tries to open the door and I forgot where I was. And I went, Hey, and they were like, James, James, you okay? I was like, yeah, what, what's happening? They're like, oh, we had a malfunction with the set. We had to take it off because I hear them saying, ladies and gentlemen, give us one second. We're about to do this thing. They opened the door and they're like, dude, why did you, was the door locked? The door doesn't lock. I was like, no, I was holding on to it. And also I realized hey, they, and the guy said, I'm just, I'm the guy. he goes, James, did you, did you say babe? <laughs> cause I was like, babe. Cause I'm used to when my wife wakes me up. Cause like, I'll wait. <laughs> He was, I was like, no, I didn't, I didn't call you babe, man. That's crazy. Are you, are you insane? I didn't, that's ridiculous. I didn't do that. That told him later, I was like, yeah, I called you, babe. He was like, did you fall asleep? And I was like, yeah, I fell asleep. He was like, man, how do you do that? And my wife will tell you, I can fall asleep anyway. I, when I was younger, I fell asleep during an interview. The like, lady was talking to me. I was, but this wasn't on Zoom. I was literally at Walden's Books talking to the lady. It was eight o'clock in the morning. I don't do mornings. And I was like, falling asleep in front of her. So I know if I don't get, if I don't get a good night's sleep, I can fall asleep anywhere on any surface. It makes no difference. So yes, I have, Caitlin, thank you. I have fallen asleep on stage. <laughs> Annalisa asked her, uh, I want to quickly answer that when she said, what's my favorite ride at Disneyland? In Disneyland, in Disney World, and in Disney Paris, it is always, it will always be the Haunted Mansion. Uh, all three are amazing. They're all a little bit different and I can't wait to see the one that's in uh, Shanghai and Japan. So I am, I, I am, love that ride. It's my favorite. Love it. Yeah, there are a lot of questions in the chat. I don't know if we're gonna be able to get to all of them, but uh, no problem. James, James, you want to grab one? Or you want to want me to keep feeding them to you? I'll keep feeding to me. No problem. All right. We got one from Jacob here. 
What do you think are the biggest changes from Aladdin Seattle to Aladdin Broadway? And which things do you miss most? Oh, um, the, biggest, the biggest change was the budget. We had no budget in, in Seattle. We had what we would call, I think my friends call it, we called it a, um, or Casey used to call it a bed on a stick. Let me explain what I mean by a bed on a stick. So when you see Aladdin on Broadway, the carpet flies. I mean, it flies, it flies, it turns, it dips and dives and weaves, and it looks amazing. In Seattle, we had a stick that came out of the stage and the carpet was on it and poor Aladdin and Jasmine were on it. And so when they sang, it looked like this, unbelievable sight. And it was terrible. And, and Casey did his best to, do, to make it look good by having the dancers dance around the stick. And we were like, wow. I really hope we get a budget if we ever go to Broadway because this is not going to work. Um, uh, you know, I didn't have like, you know, in the stage, in the stage show on Broadway, the I, I, there's hydraulics and I come out of the floor and all kinds of stuff. Nah, man, we had smoke and I would come from the side of the stage. It was awesome. So they're like, like hey, everybody, you know, it's was, it was really stupid, uh, but it, it worked. So I think the biggest thing, and we also, we also worked on um, the, the songs, you know, to give, to especially Jasmine's song, to give her a really good, to give her a song. She didn't really have a good one. So they finally gave her one, you know, Palace Walls. Uh, we also um, really tightened up what the, what the best friends did. And we also tightened up the story with Jeannie and Aladdin's relationship. So those are the biggest things. The things that I miss the most, I miss, um, I miss, I had freedom, but I miss a lot of the freedom that we did have in Seattle. But we also knew that, you know, this show has to be timeless. You know, that's the one thing Disney likes to create is a timeless uh, project that can go on, you know, 2020, but to 2000, you know, 45. And to say, you know, to say, if you watch the Aladdin cartoon, some of those jokes are dated. You know, a lot of people are just remembering that Arsenio Hall is a person because tomorrow night, um, or I should say a Friday here, you know, coming to America comes back. So to see him, see Jeannie go, hoo, 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 his kids go, I have no idea who that is. So, you know, so the dated joke. So we had to make it sure it was timeless. And when I would do the show on Broadway, I would bring in jokes that were of the time, but I would only do it for that weekend and then go back to the jokes that were timeless just to keep it the way it was, so. I remember Arsenio, but. Oh, know. hey, you know, we all, that was the biggest thing. It was like, you know, Johnny Carson and Arsenio. Yeah. <laughs> well, Miranda has a, 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 not a big stage, but a small screen question. She says your episode of Law & Order SVU was on TV today. I heard, I heard of my yeah. you about today. That what was, was it fun. like working on that show. Okay, I've always, I, I, when I got to do that show, um, I told my friends, I said, okay, I'm a New York actor now. I'm a New York actor because every actor in New York has been on Law and Order. And I was like, everybody's done Law and Order except for me, damn it. And not only did I get to do it, but I got to do a scene with Ice-T and I got to do a scene with Mariska Hargitay. So I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm now cool. you've arrived. I'm arrived, I'm, I'm a New York actor now. I've been on Law and Order. <laughs> And Max wants to know what your wrestling gimmick was going to be. Of course you did, Max. Oh, <laughs> gosh, yes. Uh, I had I had two gimmicks, actually. I had uh, one in mind uh, called A.B. Johnson, A.B. All Business. So he basically would look at the camera and he would just say, you know, hey, man, it's just business. So he was he was a villain, but everything he did was just business. So if he cheated or he beat people up or he jumped from somebody from behind, it was all business. So he couldn't be, he, I'm not responsible. I'm not, I'm not the person, it was all business. The other guy who I really, really enjoyed was a guy who was the main man, Marcus Hill. That was the one I really, really wanted to push because he was the, the main event, the main idea, the main ingredient, the main event, the main man, Marcus Hill. He was a technical wrestler. That's what I wanted to do. I really loved um, Bret Hart, Ric Flair. Um, Kurt Angle, Taz, those are my, those are my guys, or like guys now like uh, Kevin Owens, uh, Daniel Bryan, CM Punk, you know, um, Kenny Omega, those are the guys that I really, really liked because they're technical wrestlers, and so that's what I wanted to do, and uh, that's how I thought I was going to be, I thought I was going to be a, a villain and uh, keep stepping, and uh, didn't work out that way, but what's really funny is I am friends with uh, Kevin Owens, I am friends with Becky Lynch, I am friends with <laughs> Xavier Woods and Biggie Langs and all those guys. <laughs> So I'm friends and they come to Broadway and they look at me and they go, how do you do what you do? I'm like, how do you do what you do? You fell through a table. They're like, yeah, but you're tap dancing on steel. I'm like, yeah, you're right. And we, a lot of us have the same injuries, which is really sick. We, Broadway people shouldn't have the same injuries as Broadway people, but we do. So uh, that, that's the thing we've been trading back and forth. Like I hurt my knee and my knee's messed up too. I have a lower back problem. Me too. And you know, we talk about it. So it's great. <laughs> Oh, this is awesome. Oh, so May Lee says she said she says she's got a photo, her Zoom photo at with James at Hamilton in May 2017. If you're watching on grid view there, gallery view, you can see she's got a Zoom photo up. And there you are. Yes. 
There yes. you are. Ah, you asked me my boy, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a couple of questions about your most memorable moment on stage and your dream role. Those kind of go together. Uh, my most memorable moment on stage. I've had a few, um, but I think one of my most memorable moments on stage, uh, you know, what's really funny is it all depends on where you're talking. Cause like, if I have a Bay Area moment on stage, there was a moment in show, there was a moment in uh, Showboat that had nothing to do with me, but it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen in, in, in my life. Um, there's this play with the show within a show. There's the show within a show and you know, Captain Andy's on stage and he's supposed to do his monologue and the guy, the two, the two country bumpkins are in the box and they don't realize that this isn't real. So I'm on, I'm on the boat looking down and uh, one of our guys, he has, he's one of the country bumpkins, he has his gun and he's supposed to, Hey, you let her go. That the villain has her. And he goes to shoot and somebody forgot to put the cap in the gun. Same for the, put the cap in the gun. And so he goes, click, click. And he goes, bang and i lost it lost all professionalism complete loss professionalism done i am done i'm just i'm finished everybody's laughing and i i literally you know that moment where you're supposed to stay serious and i literally just bowed my head i just ducked and i i was totally i was terrible i shouldn't have done that but i did uh the other memorable thing um happened uh in and um oh it happened in memphis uh, i was working with a guy named uh, michael mcgraw who uh, who also is a Tony Award winning and a wonderful guy. He you you could probably hear his voice is uh, is Pap in um, in the Spam a lot. You know he's 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 one doing the uh, doing the um, he works he's with the King going stick stick stick. That's him. Coconuts. So <laughs> yeah, he's doing the coconuts. So he and I are on stage and we used to do this is terrible. We should have never done this on stage, but we used to do um, Jack Benny and Rochester backstage. And we would tease each other with these voices and do different things. And so he would always try to make us laugh. And so one day he calls to me and he goes, hey, Bobby. And I would always go, yeah. So this time he goes, hey, Bobby. And I went, yeah, like Rochester did. And he looks at me and he does the rest of the scene is Jack Benny. He's like, I don't know about this music at all. And the audience like kind of catches it. And the stage manager's looking at like, I will kill the both of you. Um, and the <laughs> other memorable thing on stage is Aladdin. And um, Don Daryl Rivera and I would do our best to make each other, we would try to break each other. And we were very professional. We never broke each other where the audience could see. But for three years, for three years on Broadway, we did something new to each other every single night. So um, I would buy hats that were weird. And when he was on stage during the moment where Jasmine sees Prince Abubu for the first time, he could see me in the, in the wing and I would have the weird hat on. I had a flamingo hat that was pink and was really tall and I would walk past and he would only see the flamingo head. And then I would go on stage for my character and he would build puppets. I won't say what the puppets did. I'm just gonna say he built two paper rabbits that when you pulled the string together, something happened. And he would have that off stage. And then I, um, would write things on my iPad, like, you know, Don Daryl is a terrible actor. Or I would like write characters, it was like, as <laughs> this is terrible and racist, and I probably shouldn't say this. And I was like, be less Asian, be taller. And he would just like, see it and like lose his mind. And like he would go across and like write something on his iPad. The one that got him the most, when I knew I was leaving, what I did was I called his wife and I said, Can you send me a picture of you and the family? Would you do this for me? And she said, Yes. So I got a picture of his family and I blew it up big size. And so I cut out the I cut out the face of his daughter. And so when he was looking off stage, he saw himself his wife, and then my face in the middle. And that's what we all did. <laughs> and it was terrible and wrong. And the other great thing was on stage when Whoopi Goldberg played the genie, there was a moment where we had this moment with The View where she was supposed to um, pop out the lamp. And um, you know, you're not supposed to take pictures on stage. And there was Disney, the Disney people and The View people were all like, you can't do this, you can't say this, you can't do this. And I'm like, and that, then Whoopi looks at me and she goes, okay, now that they've said all that, we're going to do whatever we want to do because she's Whoopi. So Whoopi just starts, she has no script. She just starts making stuff up. Everything, you, if you see the clip um, on The View or on YouTube, everything we're doing is completely made up. We had like a small group of small thing of what we thought we were going to do. And then at the end, I said, oh my God, I have to do this. So I pulled out my camera and took a picture. So the picture that you see when they flash it back, the Disney people and The View people, grow, they said, whatever picture you have, and I thought they were going to say erase this and we need that picture. So the picture you see is the one that I actually took as a selfie from the two of us. 
And that was the coolest thing because I got to be on stage with my hero. You know, Whoopi and I got to be dressed as the GD together. So those are the things. I mean, trust me, there are other terrible things. Um, I'll give you one last one for so just so you can have a Hamilton one. Most people know about uh, the burst corners, you know, me messing up lines, but there was a night that has nothing to do with lines. It was a night where we actually said all our lines correctly. But what happened was it's hot, it's summertime, and New York has giant horse flies. So we are doing Washington on your side. And it's uh, brand, it's a uh, it happened with Brandon, but the funniest one happened with Daniel Breaker playing Burr. So I'm rapping to Daniel Breaker and Daniel Breaker is a horrible person. I love him dearly, he's a horrible person. So the fly flies in and lands on Daniel Breaker's face and he doesn't flick it. He just looks at me. Now the fly is this big, so it catches the light. So the audience sees the fly fly on Daniel's face. So they start laughing. We keep rapping. The fly flies to me. I swing at it, he swings at it. So it looks like we're playing badminton with this fly, but we're still rapping. Finally, the audience just starts, they start clapping like just hysterically because we have kept going. And so by the time Mulligan gets in, Mulligan will not stand next to us. He refuses because he's afraid the fly is going to fly on him. So me and Daniel are together and Mulligan is like 50 feet away. If he's like, if we're, we're supposed to be on, <laughs> we're supposed to be on three, zero and three. We're on three, zero and 10. He is way on. He's like, nope, not coming near you because there's a fly and the fly is still flying around. And it only happened during that song. Every summer we have been attacked by this fly family that just wants to only be in Washington on your side. So those are the crazy stories that have happened to me. Trust me, there's many, many more, but that's, that will take all night. But yeah, those are the ones that stick with me. The Bay Area, Aladdin, and Hamilton. <laughs> oh, Joey mentions it's probably the same fly that was on Mike Pence's head. Hey. Probably. <laughs> at, least, at least it's in the same family. Like they all like, yo, they think, they, we gonna be on TV. Well, I don't want to be on TV. I'm even on Broadway. I'm going to Broadway. You go to TV. I'm going to Broadway. So yeah, I love it. There seems to be a whole conversation going on here about getting you to be in Rocky Horror at City Lights, <laughs> which uh, I think is a fine idea. <laughs> you know what? I, I won't. I won't lie. I, if if it came up, it'd be something my wife would, my wife and I would discuss. I'm like, you know what? Yeah. I mean, I mean, James, you and Don could like kick it in the bay for a while and see Seriously. your family. I bet your mom would be behind this idea. Oh, yeah, until she's, she's giving a thumbs up. She's giving a thumbs up until she saw what the costume was. She'd be like, are you in heels and lace? But then she'd probably lose her mind and laugh and to have a ball with it. So yeah. And you know I'll what? go there, baby. I'll I go won't. there. <laughs> hey, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I look, I'm not saying I won't do it. I'm not saying I won't do it. I won't say I'll be your riff, baby. No, Let's baby, do I'm it. Like, Kid, I want you to direct it for me, baby. I want you. I want you in the seat. I want you in the seat. <laughs> Wait, I, you have any idea what you're saying? Yes, I, I know exactly. I what think I get to be in the seat. <laughs> oh, sorry, Lisa. You get sorry, Lisa. You get, yeah, and and you know one other little tidbit. I just didn't know, can, Lisa. I just didn't know if you actually wanted to go through what Brooke went through of having me and Kit in the same show together. Oh, I'm ready. Okay, I can so have you, have you, James. Have you ever been directed by Lisa? No. Yeah, Thanks, Lisa, you in the seat. I don't think there's a problem there. <laughs> your, 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 and you know what your... else, James? I won't. I won't even ask you to audition. <laughs> she'll ask me to audition, though. Yes. I guarantee you, of course, she'll ask course, me to audition. Kid. She's like, she's like, can you still do it? Kid? Can you still sing it? <laughs> and yeah. as, as marketing director, I think this is a great idea because I'm running the hell out of this thing. <laughs> oh, we would. Do you know how many people from New York would fly down to see my big boss? Hello, oh. and I will. Can... All the money. <laughs> That's why it was funny because like I wouldn't do it in New York. You have to do it in the Bay, so folks would come too and say, "Wait, he's doing what?" Oh yeah, they would come. So yeah, let's let's let's, let's discuss it. Let's talk about yeah, it. Yeah, let's make it happen. Oh, uh, there are some people in the chat who are already ready to buy their tickets. So. I'm all in, baby. <laughs> I'm all in. <laughs> I'm all, I, I love it. it that, I would. I'm not gonna lie to you. I would have a ball. And I would, I'll, I'll, once it's over, I'll tell Dawn, and she's gonna be like, "Oh God, yeah, we probably have to see that." Because my daughter <laughs> would lose her freaking mind. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm gonna pull one more question from the chat. I think we're probably sure. gonna wrap it up pretty soon, but uh, there, I think Noah's asked a couple of times about Gotham, so we gotta jump in here. Tell oh. us what was it like having a role in Gotham? Gotham was ridiculous because, uh, as you know, I have a Batman tattoo on my left arm. Batman is my favorite hero since I was a kid. My mom can attest to that. I had a little um, pedal car Batmobile. I used to dress as Batman. I used to run around the house going, nee, 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 nee. That was, it was ridiculous. I had a Batman. It was terrible. Uh, so to be a part of that, 
um, legacy. And also the story I was in was a story about the Flying Graysons. So there I'm, I'm playing the ring, ringmaster and the parents of Dick Grayson are in this episode. And the guy they got looks exactly like Dick Grayson. So I was just, you know, loving it. And, uh, you know, the only crazy thing is, you know, it, it's, it's still shooting, it's still television. It was 30 degrees in New York and we had to film outside and it was the fun story is we filmed all this stuff outside they had made a giant circus and giant park and we filmed all this in the cold and they every Sunday would call cut someone would run over to us and put a big jacket on and we would have to put our hands in these warm things and put hats on and then they would go okay action and then someone would come and take all that crap off of us and we would do the scene and then but we had to follow this laser pointer because if you see the episode we're supposed to follow this snake because the snake goes to the lady so we do this we said when do we get the snake oh we get the snake later because it's cold we can't do that great so i think i'm thinking cgi i come to the set the next day and we're in a heated building where they have built the whole set that we had outside in 30 degrees just so we could have the snake so the snake got to be in the building with the same exact set we had outside and i was like you could have filmed this in this room for the people and not freezing our butts off everybody had colds our lead the guy the lead he was he was sniffing and snotting and the girl was too and we, the, the director was dying and the snake is fine and then the snake decided he wanted she 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 wanted to talk to everybody so there's this like giant 12 foot snake that's like walking up the leg of this guy he doesn't know and we're like uh john john and when john turns around the snake's belly's on the floor but his head it her head is here and he and the guy's like don't freak out don't freak out and john is like trying to like just talk about the script and this nigga's like hey how you doing and we so every time i think about that episode all i keep thinking about is the fact that we froze our butts off for like literally six hours and the the call time was midnight so they called so we were there from one o'clock in the morning six o'clock in the morning and then we get there the next day and it's like you know wonderful you know 60 degrees inside this beautiful building i was like man this tv stuff is messed up but it was great. Gotham was awesome. I got to, when I saw the episode. It's still the fact that I get to be a part of the uh, the legendary pantheon of Batman's story is cool. Even just a small part, just a small part of Batman's you know legacy is is awesome. So it's been great. I seriously, my face hurts from smiling. This is like the best <laughs> next stage episode ever. Because I've also gotten to be able to be a part of DC and also a part of Marvel. You know, I've written three Marvel comic stories. I wrote a Spider-Man story. I wrote a, a Brock and Groot story. And I wrote an original Spider-Man story. So to get to be able to be part of Marvel and to be a part of DC, that that my mom, my mom knows. That was my childhood. You know, I spent, I, I would do my homework so I could go see cartoons. So I could go read comic books. So I could be a part of that. Um, my my god brother Bug uh, William he had all these comic books and gave them to me and that's how I found it my best friend John would introduce me to the Marvel universe uh, with comic books back when I was around 14 years old and the fact that I get to be you know 46 damn near 50 years old and live in this world is really fun <laughs> oh this is fantastic <laughs> one more question from Joey what's your favorite Marvel movie oh you know what? Honestly, uh, I'm going to shock you guys. My favorite Marvel movie is Doctor Strange. I'm a huge fan of magicians. So I'm a Harry Potter fan to my soul. So if it has to do with magic, I'm in it. Don't get me wrong. I know most, you know, I, I love Black Panther. Don't get me wrong. Black Panther, my man, I go. But there's something about watching all the magic stuff happen and just watching. Yes, baby, I see you. I see you. I see you, Joey. I see you. Um, there's something about Black Panther. It was dope. But there'll be something about Doctor Strange coming in. Also, you know, when you think about it, without Doctor Strange, um, that last scene of Endgame wouldn't have happened because the great part is, you know, you hear Rhodey say, you mean you hear Falcon say, yo, Cap, can you hear me? On your left. And then all the circles opened up. Without Doctor Strange, they would still be in whatever plane they were on because they, how they going to travel there? They couldn't. They, they, by the time they got there, Cap would be dead and the world would be over. So without Doctor, so Doctor Strange is like my thing. And I, I just love that character. And I also love the way uh, Jack Kirby used to draw him, you know, the psychedelic style. That psychedelic style started back then. And the fact that they brought it up to the MCU now, and also Benedict Cumberbatch is just one of the dopest actors in the history of life. He's one of those guys that pisses you off because his English accent is so cool. But then when he speaks American, he makes you feel like you don't speak English well. You're like, damn, I'm American. And I still don't speak my own language as well as you do. So that's that's my favorite MCU movie. But my favorite thing right now is WandaVision, which I'll be watching once we get off this damn, which one of the things? Yes. <laughs> 
you got some people dancing here and there in their Listen, little man, if you ain't watching WandaVision, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> uh, James, this has been so much fun. Thank you so Thank much. You so much for being with us tonight. My pleasure. My pleasure. If folks, you want to turn your mics on and just say a big thank you. Everyone's all muted there. Want to turn your mics on and just say a big thank you. Thanks for being here. Oh, look at thank Caitlin. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, thank you, so thank you, James. Thank you, thank you. Great to see you. Thank you very much. All right, we'll be back next week with playwright Michael Mitnick, who one of the things he wrote was the, the current war with Benedict Cumberbatch, interestingly. Um, but until then, everybody stay safe. Have a great rest of your night. And thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you, so Becky. Much, thank you, so much. Thank you James. Oh, you. You're awesome. Thank you, James. Oh, my God. Yes, you're awesome. Thank you.